thought the door was locked. Welcome everybody, I'm your host, Mig G, here with Alex Macklin and CTP. We got A.A. Ron <laughs> and with Horshig, here to talk about squatting. And some more shit. And, and some, some more shit. shit. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, all right. What's up, guys? I'm Mike McGoldrick, Alex Macklin, CTP behind the camera. We've got Aaron Horshig here from Squat University. What's going on, everybody? A.A. Ron. A.A. <laughs> Ron. Aaron came down to join us for the day. We just filmed a podcast with him earlier and made a really cool uh, technique wad type video, basically showing you uh, how to uh, squat. How to scroll. How to screen. <laughs> how to scroll. <laughs> how to screen a squat. Uh, starting with the hips and ankles and then uh, things to do from there once you find out like what some of the issues might be. But now we asked you some questions online. We want to take a few minutes to run through those questions. We put up a post on the Instagrams. Yep. I'll be more specific. We put a post on the Instagrams asked, <laughs> uh, asking you what questions you wanted to ask Aaron. And now we're going to go through those one by one and kind of put him on the spot and see, see how much he actually knows. First question, this actually covers a couple of them. Hey Alex, are those no bull shoes working <laughs> out? Are they really worth $129? Wait a minute, he, somebody asked that? <laughs> well, I got a discount, cause I, I got it like that. Cause you're special. But, <laughs> but I love them, I no. love mine. All right, so first question from <laughs> at, at jzena43. When squaring, when squaring, when squatting, should you keep your torso as straight as possible and just sink straight down in your squat, or should you get some coward bend on your torso and sick your hips back and down? Yeah, we I, all about this. I don't know where Jay Zen is from. Forward bend. Forward, Forward bend and stick your hips back and down. Yeah, yeah. We talked okay. about this a little yeah. bit in the show. Yeah, for but sure. Yeah. All right. So let's, great, let's great question. So here's the thing. Again. Whenever you're doing a body weight squat or a barbell squat, it's all about remaining in balance. So your center of gravity needs to remain over the middle of your foot. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a body weight squat, you're going to have a more forward lean of your trunk because your center of gravity near your stomach for most people is going to be more inclined mm -hmm. to be able to stay in balance, right? Now when you're doing a barbell squat, the bar then becomes your center of gravity. Right. So if you look at the squat from the side, that bar needs to remain over the middle of your foot. So depending on the type of squat you're doing or the dimensions of your body is going to change how much hip hinge you have and how much forward lean you have, right? So if you have an athlete, let's say that's doing a low bar back squat, right? That bar is a little bit lower uh, on their shoulder blades, right? And in order to keep that bar over the middle of their foot, they're going to have to naturally have a more, uh, hip a larger hip hinge. Yeah. And then their chest is going to have to reflexively come forward more. That's why power lifters who squat low bar have a more inclined trunk position, yeah. right? It's all about staying in balance. Yeah. You then take that person, let's say we're doing a front squat, same dimensions of the person. Uh -huh. In order to keep that bar over the middle of their foot, they're gonna have a very much more upright trunk position, yeah. right? Now, the same qualities of movement still apply though, because we still need a, a hip hinge to start the squat, so uh -huh. we limit that premature forward movement of the knees, keep the knees safe, yeah. and then stay in balance, right? But the amount of hip hinge is gonna be so much smaller, so that's the big thing, is that even though I say every squat should start with the hips, the amount of that hip movement is going to be dictated by the position of the bar in order to stay balanced. Oh yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna be, for a front squat, you're not gonna sit your ass back exactly. because your chest is gonna drop, because your chest drops, then the bar is gonna go to the floor, because yeah. that's what, it's the weight, the load is so much far for. Now, exactly. How would if, okay, let's say if you were new to squatting, mm -hmm. like, you know, what is a little bit or whatever, like, exactly. are there any kind of cues that you use to like? Yeah. So I like, especially let's say you're doing a back squat. I like to say, engage your glutes. And you'll actually, if you do it very slowly and push your butt back and bring your chest forward, you'll feel those muscles tighten up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then from there, let's say you're doing a high bar back squat or a front squat and you need to keep an upright chest. Basically sitting your butt straight down under your heels after that is a great way yeah. to maintain, to where you're, you're still getting a hip hinge, but you're not throwing your hips yeah. back way too far. Because the, the thing we don't want to do is for people to think that the hip hinge means we need to throw the hips real far back. Yeah. Because reflexively, you're just going to throw yourself off balance. I think yeah. one, th the, that's the key word is balance. Yeah. And I think what you were saying earlier yeah. is that your foot is like a tripod. And yes. you, want, you want the distribution of weight to be equally on those three points of contact. Exactly. So essentially where, you're, where you would be is midfoot. So I, mm -hmm. I, I kind of tend to tell people like when you squat, you should feel your whole foot glued to the floor. Exactly. And if you're off balance because your hips are too far back, like you're way on the heels, mm -hmm. or you're too forward and your weight's on your toes, then you're not balanced. And then you're probably not in a good position for the squat anyways. Exactly. So a lot of people, whenever we watch someone squat, and if they move poorly, a lot of times it's a knee issue, right? That, you know, that's a symptom that comes out. The knees either go really far forward, they collapse in, right? Yeah. As long as your squat starts with the hips a little bit, 
all that you you know need to think about is staying in balance. The yeah. knees will go where they should if they stay right, in line with the right. toes. You don't need to worry about whether or not they go forward more or less or stay back behind the toes. It's all about staying in balance yeah, because balance. everyone's squat is going to look a little bit different mm -hmm. based on their anatomy. Right. There's no one size fits all to squatting. It's all about starting at the hips and staying in balance, yeah. and the rest takes care of itself. Yeah, I think people don't even think about like just looking at the feet. Like that's where I mean that's exactly. your point of contact. It's where you go to put, actually start generating force. So, exactly. It's all like, about Staying yeah, I really liked it. If, if you haven't watched that video yet, we did with Aaron. Like, go watch that video because we talk about the balance of the foot, and mm -hmm. that's that's where that's where your foundation is. Exactly, a stable foot sets the foundation for the rest of your body to move well on top of. Yeah. And we know we all know how tall a pyramid is, right? Why does it Why does it Quote, I love that Louis quote. Simmons. <laughs> I love that quote from Louis Simmons. All right, next question. Hey, uh, that, I have watched that. Well, so you knew well, exactly what I was saying. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I swear, I was, gonna, I was gonna find a part of the podcast to throw that out there because yeah. I. It's you, a great you watch quote. the newest one with the band, or we, I don't know if I watched the newest. Uh, one. I yeah, remember I Louis saying that. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's awesome. We, there's so many good quotes. The one with me and Kurt, like yeah. doing the bandit cleans with him, so good. It's yeah, so good. I think I listened. It's to a quote. It's a quote. Treasure trove. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, next next question. Uh, from at Scarlet Fever, 6182. Scarlet oh, Fever. Oh, Scarlet Fever. Uh, what? You naughty. <laughs> <laughs> is there a good screen to see if your medial chain tightness is causing restrictions in your squat? Can the medial chain be a smoking gun for knee valgus? I think what she means is uh, basically are my adductors too tight and is that causing my knees to cave in or collapse? My, for sure. Yeah, let's, maybe my, let's, we have a lot of terms defined in here. Let's define medial chain and valgus and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So when she's referring to medial, she's referring to her adductor. So the muscles on the inside. The, the groin. Body. The inner yeah, thigh. The, the yeah. groin yeah. muscles. Yeah. Exactly. Now, can those become excessively stiff or tight? For sure. Is that a main reason for people having the knee collapse in? In my opinion, no. Now, the reason that those muscles become excessively stiff is then where you need to find through screening process why that's happening. A lot of times, those muscles are becoming stiff as a compensation to something else being very weak or not kicking on at the right time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a coordination issue yeah. or it could be a mobility issue somewhere else. And a lot of times I feel like those areas are gonna get excessively stiff because the, uh, the muscles and the tissues on the outside of the body aren't working correctly. Yeah. Exactly, so their glutes aren't firing correctly, yeah. uh, especially the lateral hip muscles. Mm -hmm. So in, in an attempt to stay stable, the body compensates and it's going to find excessive tightness in that, uh, that medial chain area. So it's all about not just addressing the symptoms, right? Because a lot of times people will find that and they'll say, oh, well, I'll foam roll, yeah. I'll stretch. You're just yeah. addressing the symptoms. Why are they tight? Exactly, yeah. you always need to address the why. Same thing with knee pain or any really back pain, right? It's not just about addressing the symptoms. As a physical therapist or just as anyone, a practitioner trying to, you know, augment pain, for sure you need to do stuff to address the symptoms. Yeah. But in the end, you're not going to have any lasting change unless you address the why, yeah. Yeah. which a lot we of times... We pain. You said augment. <laughs> augment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we want to reduce pain. <laughs> <Yeah>. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, we need to address the why, which is going to be, right, a lot of times retraining the body to coordinate and turn on muscles yeah. at certain times. Yeah. Okay, so she asked if there's a good screen for this. So we talked about one yeah. earlier. You could lie on your back, mm -hmm. put your knee on the, put your foot on the opposite knee. Let me just show real quick. It's a oh. question for him. I might be a little tough. Uh, it, it's tough for people to really do, per, you know, as far as movement or muscle stiffness. Okay. Uh, length changes can be a little tough because sometimes muscles can be a little shortened, but uh -huh. you'll still have more full mobility. The biggest thing I would say is just watch someone move. Take yeah. them out of their shoes and watch them move. They should be able to keep their knees in line with their toes, even if they have excessive stiffness okay. in their groin muscles right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, can it be a smoking gun for knee valgus? Is that in, typically an issue that you see? So, in my opinion, the reason why a lot of people valgus in their knees is caving either do, the caving knees. in, yeah. so the knees are going to cave in. Arch uh, collapse in the foot. Exactly. So it's, it's usually two things. Either you're going to have a mobility problem, a coordination problem, or a combination of the two. Or could it ever be an anatomy issue? Because I've read some, like a lot of women tend to have yeah. this issue because the hip angle. Like the for hips. sure. There, there's definitely a factor for that, right? Mm -hmm. So women naturally have a larger Q angle, right. which what that means is that their, uh, their femurs point inwards more. So the Q angle is anatomically how we measure from the hips going down into the knees, mm -hmm. right? So women, because they're wider set hips, they naturally have a more Q angle. Now, mm -hmm. 
uh, research, if you look into all the different things that causes knee valgus, right? There's definitely that. There's a hormonal response as well, yeah. you know. Um, but in the end, I think the, the biggest thing is it's a movement issue, mm -hmm. right? And it's a coordination issue as far as when muscles are kicking on at the right time. And what you'll see is a lot of these athletes, um, they'll be able to nice and slowly, right, go into a full squat sometimes. Mm -hmm. But then you tell them, hey, do it quick. Right, and then their knees slam in. Yeah. Right, so it's that. That's the like coordination. Catching it clean or something like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they can do things slow and controlled. If they can get into a deep squat with slow and controlled movement, it's telling me that their mobility, their functional movement, mm -hmm. isn't bad. But as soon as they go to do something that's got a quicker tempo, then their knees come in. That's showing me right there. That's a smoking gun for a coordination issue. Mm -hmm. So then retrain their movement. So that's why, as a physical therapist, my goal isn't just to retrain your slow movements. Right. Most people think of physical therapy. You know, 20 years ago. I was like, well, we're going to do all these bed exercises and then you may do some standing stuff. If I'm not getting you out on a field or on the court or doing some jumping plyometrics, lateral bounding movements and testing your dynamic knee control with yeah. faster tempo things, I'm doing a disservice for you as a practitioner, right? Because injuries don't happen slow and controlled. Yeah. Right? Injuries happen when we're going fast mm -hmm. and all of a sudden our body's coordination doesn't catch up with how our movement is. Got it. Yeah. Makes so, sense. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next question. Um, at Michael Weeb seven asked, other than ankle and hip mobility, what is the best way to counteract imbalances developing from a squat that isn't completely symmetrical? Great question. So the biggest Great thing, question, weight crisp, <laughs> weight, I gave it to you. it's all that sushi. <laughs> the biggest thing I do is I take athletes when we're screening, right? We, we usually take the shoes off and we do a straightforward uh, foot squat, right? I also ask you to do a single leg squat. Too often today, we only think about the squat as a double leg movement or an exercise, right? But we forget single leg. Every single athlete should have the ability to do a single leg squat. Now, the depth of that's obviously gonna be based on a number of things. My big guys, 300 pound linemen, you're not gonna be able to pistol squat most of the time. But that doesn't mean you still should have the ability to do a good single leg squat, maybe mm -hmm. to an eight, eight inch excursion depth, mm -hmm. okay? When you don't have that ability to coordinate your body on one leg, it's going to set yourself up to have some movement asymmetry, right? Yeah. You're going to start tilting side to side. Well, we were, I was asking you about this yeah. earlier. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. that's like a lot of people, the hip twist, right? Yeah. So they'll get down in a squat and then you'll see one, them twisting on the come way up. up. The other, yeah. <clears throat> exactly. So I'll see that athlete doing that. Instantly, I know the movement problem's there, right? So how do I identify exactly what's going on? Well, if we're able to squat all the way down and, you know, more with a body weight squat, I can tell also if they have a functional mo mobility issue, right? But that coordination, get them single leg and have them do a deep single leg squat, mm -hmm. right? And you'll be able to see that athlete, maybe they feel less stable on one side versus the other, or as soon as they go down on the right side, oop, the knee went in, yeah. or they fell off balance, that's a coordination issue mm -hmm. right certain muscles aren't kicking on at the right time maybe you're you know exposing some weakness of a certain area of muscle you know so to fix it right you work single leg yeah. right we do the touchdown squats we talked about before working now just because you can't do a pistol squat doesn't mean you can't do a good body weights you know single leg squat right so we'll retrain that i call it the touchdown progression yep. okay in, in doing in so yeah so fixing single leg will then help you overall fix your double leg squat movement issues gotcha yeah. yeah we talked about a lot uh that a lot in the the shrug strength challenge videos and yeah. the shrug strength test episode as well about when you have imbalances <laughs> bilaterally doing single leg work basically helping one leg that's weaker get stronger to catch up with the other leg will help rule mm -hmm. that out um but do you ever see a case where that doesn't work like so someone someone you you train them single leg for a while and mm -hmm. then you do single leg testing and they both seem equal on each side mm -hmm. then you put a bar back on their back and you watch them squat and their patterns are still shifting, the hips shifting or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there, there's gonna be times uh, when you do find an athlete that's still almost like a, a puzzle case. For some reason, sure. you still can't get that direct piece to fit in to complete the puzzle. And that's when you, you need to go find someone who knows exactly what to do to be able to break them down even more. Because sometimes gotcha. you may need a little bit more corrective exercise. That's an honest answer. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's times where, I mean, every practitioner has had this problem. You have an athlete and you've done everything you can. Yeah. Yeah. And for some reason, their, their pain's still there or their movement just is just getting fix. exactly and it, it's it happens to every single practitioner whether yeah. you're a medical doctor chiropractor physical therapist there's times where you're beating your head against the wall and saying why is this person not getting better yeah. what am i missing right maybe even compliance on the athlete's part they may maybe not be to yeah they may not be doing the things <laughs> that you want to do for sure you know? so, so i mean and that's when you know really going out and trying to ask other people hey can 
you know, have a, you know, lend your eyes over here. What do you see? Right. Cause yeah. a lot of times, you know, that's a big thing is we all want to do stuff on our own. Yeah. I'm the first person to say, I, I'm not an expert, mm -hmm. right? I know a lot of stuff about squatting, physical therapy, Olympic weightlifting, but don't come to me saying that I'm the expert in that because you're, you're never an expert in anything that you do. You're always learning. You should yeah. always be learning. So every single day I'm trying to learn something new from yeah. someone else so that I can improve upon the way that I treat patients, the way that I approach physical therapy, sports performance and stuff like that. Yeah. So really asking someone else, Hey, what do you think? What, yeah. what's your opinion on what we could be doing at this? Yeah. You can get an idea. That's going to help you the person. Uh, Overlooked. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think to that, to that point where we talk about single leg stuff. Anyways, yeah. I feel like uh, you know if you do a lot of squatting. Yeah. Anyways, barbell squatting, you definitely should put in some single leg work for just for the functionality of it. For sure. For example, I'm you know I don't have any knee pain right now or any back pain. I do single leg squats two times a week, two yeah. three times a week. Right? Even things like just and step ups. ups. You know, exactly. step ups. Something small single leg yeah. is really going to help you decrease the potential. Mm -hmm. for an imbalance imbalances occurring. yep exactly absolutely cool all right next question from at jesse boone 91 love both you guys content you both have definitely helped mold my philosophy on training i would love to know his thoughts your thoughts you <laughs> on squatting when returning from acl surgery i had surgery eight months ago to replace my acl after i tore playing volleyball for sure. All yeah, right. We just talked about it. Was it soccer and volleyball or was yeah. it? Uh, exactly. Yeah. So like we talked about before, right? Girls who play uh, soccer and basketball are already tearing their ACL at a rate that's three, sometimes five times more than boys. Mm -hmm. If you play those sports year round as a girl, a lot of times you're at 5% risk career wise at having this you know, devastating injury, right? Now, here's the deal. As a physical therapist, I see a ton of ACL reconstructions. In the squat is one of the most basic exercises we're doing from day one, right? Now, there's gonna be instances if they have a meniscus repair, mm -hmm. right? A lot of uh, post-op protocols will not allow weight bearing yeah. for a couple weeks. Yeah, my wife tore her ACL and meniscus. Exactly. And, and the recovery from the ACL was way different. Exactly, because that meniscus needs time to hear if, yeah. they, if, if they repair it versus if they scope it and cut it out. Okay, so there's obviously, if they repair it and they stitch it back up, mm -hmm. a lot of times they won't allow a lot of weight bearing for a couple of weeks and they'll have range of motion restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say we're at, um, you know, week nine or whatever, week 10, right? Mm -hmm. At that time, most of the post-op protocols are very similar, right? Because you had that original injury and the, uh, the weight bearing protocols, yeah. uh, restrictions are all gone, right? I'm using squats with every single person that has this injury. Now, the thing comes down to when are we getting back into barbell training? Right now, around usually about that 10, 12 weeks, um, I'm starting returning my football players to some barbell training. I'm probably for most of my ACLs, let's just say it's a regular ACL tear, maybe MCLs involved, but meniscus is fine or they scoped it out. We're doing squats week one. Mm -hmm. Some about right? just body weight, body weight, squats, body weight, squats. Body weight yeah. squats. Now I'm probably starting to add in a little bit of weight, right? Mm -hmm. Usually I have them hold a kettlebell, yeah. right? Weeks two, three, four, eventually as we keep on so going, pretty quick. They're, they're holding weight. Yeah. Most patients should be able to perform that. Now here's the deal. What I'm not doing is having them go as aggressive. A, they probably won't be able to regain their mobility, right? Yeah. Most athletes take, I want you to see as if you're one of my athletes that has a torn ACL reconstruction, we're probably gonna try to aim for getting full mobility back in that knee weeks yeah. four through six. That's my end goal. Now, sometimes there's patients that it takes much longer. That's a tough most, process too. It is a tough yeah. process. Um, you know, and that's my goal is to get most people back to full knee mobility, right? That's being able to flex your knee. Mm -hmm. Now, the ability to functionally get down into a deep squat is very different mm -hmm. because there's a lot of things that were injured and a right. lot of things that are still healing. Yeah. So a lot of times some athletes won't be able to get down into an ass to grass squat, even body weight, like stretching wise mm -hmm. until maybe they're like 12, 16 weeks out. Right. And when oh, we wow. start introducing some running and stuff like that, yeah. some I, athletes I can, some athletes can't. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. So that's the big thing is when do we start, right? Returning to barbell. Well, they better be able to show me that they can go really, really deep pain free, mm -hmm. right? Before I introduce a barbell because a barbell is just going to add more. Yeah, it's fat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had athletes start barbell squatting, you know, sometimes a probably closer to 10 to 12. Cause a lot of times early on barbell squatting is not the first thing I need to redo for this athlete. There's a reason they tore their ACL. So there's a lot more stuff I need to be working on as yeah. far as single leg strength, 
lateral I was agility. Ask, I was gonna ask, do you add those components in before you even consider barbell loading? Like <clears throat> yes. you have them have specific tests for single leg squatting that they do? For sure, so stability. my my first four weeks, right? That's sort of yeah. your basic, you're early on in the ACL reconstructive healing phase, right? So we're trying to get out swelling out of the knee. We're trying to restore range of motion, decrease pain, right? We're trying to turn back muscles on like your VMO, right? That yep. gets selectively inhibited because yeah, there's a lot of swelling. Yeah, it's crazy how much it atrophies. Exactly. So whenever, whenever there's a small amount of swelling in your knee, right? Mm -hmm. It'll shut down your VMO quicker than your other parts of your VMO quad. VMO is... VMO, so... Teardrop. There we go. Teardrop, right? When there's uh, VM, enough swelling VMO. in the knee, right? There's been, I think it's like 20 to 30 cc's of fluid in that knee will shut this part of your muscle down more so than the rest, mm. right? It takes about 50 to 60 cc's to be able to shut these down, right? Mm. So that's why if you have a good amount of swelling in the joint from a surgery, this muscle part of the quad right there will be selectively inhibited. Now here's the deal. I can't retrain the VMO over the others. They all kick on at the same time, right? So a lot of people are like, well, I'm doing VMO training. Mm. You're not doing VMO training. When you I think they meant VO2 training. <laughs> <laughs> when, <laughs> when, you, when you squeeze your quad, right? When you flex it, they all come on at the same time. Right. However, when you're dealing with an injury, if you have swelling in that knee, that part of the quad will selectively be inhibited Right, not kick on at the right time. I guess the only way would be some kind of electrical stem, right? Yeah, you can kick on, yeah, you can turn on some electrical stimulation yeah. on that. And for some athletes, they need that to be yeah. able to get that quad to fire again, right? So that's first four weeks, right? So we're at like weeks five through First four eight. weeks you would be doing? Where it's more, you know, range of motion, okay. learning how to walk again, because a lot yeah. of athletes that aren't able uh -huh. to actually put a lot of pressure through that. Uh, we're kicking, learning how to do a straight leg raise again, mm -hmm. getting the quads to fire and whatnot, learning how to do a, per, you know, body weight squat. Mm -hmm. Then we come down to the strength, basic strength learning to squat, do a single leg squat, right? I'm probably teaching them how to do a small little touchdown squat weeks two, mm -hmm. right? Weeks one and two, right? And then they're getting back to doing some lateral agility eventually like 12, 16 weeks. 16 weeks is usually the time where most athletes start running again. Do you, do you have a video of you, if we don't get a chance to film yeah. this, of a video of you doing a touchdown squat just for people to yes, see? Yes, I do. Actually, if you go to squatuniversity.com, yeah, it's uh, under the article, Six Steps to a Perfect Pistol Squat, mm -hmm. and it's a progression, right? Because not everyone's going to be able to get a perfect pistol, mm -hmm. but steps one through three is a progression of yeah. a touchdown. It's like the smallest two-inch box up to an eight-inch box. And this is just your progression, and obviously, like, I mean, she would probably be going to... I mean, what is she doing? Is she she asking for advice like on how to progress herself, or is she going to somebody? She had surgery eight months ago to replace <clears throat> ACL after so she tore it. Eight months ago, so you should be back with good physical therapy to the point where you can do a deep squat without pain. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully under a barbell again. I would hope. Yeah. Usually, I mean, most patients are going to be discharged from you at around that. For me, at least thirty. 34 weeks uh -huh. out. I mean, I hold on to some patients a little bit longer just because the way we'll stretch some things out um, because I need to get you back to a high level of agility and whatnot yeah. and sports specific training. <clears throat> but at eight months, yeah, she should be able to do that. Now, here's the deal. The different stresses that your body handle are going to be changed with the type of squat you're doing, right? So by doing like a sort of a low bar back squat at first, you're not going to have as much knee torque placed on the body whenever right. you're going down because the moment arm, right, we're getting into real science. When you look at the, the squat and you draw that line from the bar straight down through the middle of the foot, right, because mm -hmm. we're in balance, you're going to be able to separate the thigh right into a moment arm at the knee and a moment arm at the hip yeah. right? the longer the moment arm is the more torque that you're able to generate at that joint yeah. right so with the low bar back squat the hips are way far back the chest is more forward right yeah. so we create a longer moment arm at the hip joint and a shorter moment arm at the knee joint okay okay yeah. so there's gonna be a lot less torque on the knee yeah compared to the hips yeah. right hips are strongest joints in our body they you know the amount of ledger leverage that we generate there that's why most uh you know uh power lifters use that low bar back squat to squat over a thousand pounds right yeah so we then take that to a front squat right in the front there the torque generation is going to be more evenly balanced yeah so an athlete that has knee pain or is recovering from a knee injury would benefit more from a low bar back squat position right because mm -hmm. it's placing less torque less on the knee joint knee. than right. a front squat right, right. now advice. yeah so that's the big thing is like coming back from an injury if you're still having that pain a there's you got to find out why you're still having the pain and fix that but that doesn't mean you still can't squat yeah, yeah. you just may have to change up the way you squat for a while that almost seems kind of obvious but yeah it's not i mean you wouldn't even think about it that way but yeah i mean yeah. i would almost say yeah the front squat i would avoid especially yeah. if you're coming back from knee because it is such a front-loaded 
squat. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying low bar back squat too, not high bar, which is also pretty, right. pretty high neat. Bar, yeah. High bar. High bar is gonna be very yeah. similar to a front squat. Exactly. It's sort of like yeah. the in between. There's a little right. bit more of a hip hinge, but it's still a very, you know, yeah. straight up and down squat. Would you still? Would you still have that person squat as deep as they could? I would have them squat pain free. Okay. That's the big thing is you never want to push, push into pain push because into like pain, we said again, right. pain's a warning light that something's going on with mm -hmm. your body. And if you continue to push into pain, yeah. especially with a load on your back, eventually something bad's going to happen. Yeah. Sounds like if you just use your head. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, move He's to a easier range of said than done, right? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's hard yeah. to do because, you yeah. know, you're, you've been out for, who knows, like eight months. Yeah. You want to yeah. fucking get back to it. Exactly. and. You know, you're you're trying to you're trying to get that lost time back. You yeah, know? it's hard. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That's about it. Um, on the on the questions, anything else you want to add? Where can the people find you? Yeah. Uh, you can find me at Squat University across all social media platforms: uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, our main blog website is SquatUniversity.com. We come out with weekly articles on anything squat related, as far as mobility, stability, technique work, debunking squat myths like we did today. Yeah. So definitely check out that episode because that was check a lot of fun. Check out episode number 2XX. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be 233. 233? Oh, yeah. Have you ever thought about pronouncing your company's name the uh, Cart Cartman way? The Cartman? Universitat? Oh, yeah. Squat <laughs> Universitat. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I appreciate it, Aaron. Yeah, Aaron, it was a lot of See fun. See you guys.